welcome to the channel get rich today the company we are going to look into belongs to pharma industry so as usual let's first have a look into pharma industry if you are looking to the global pharmaceutical industry outlook so the global spending on medicines is forecast to reach 1.5 trillion dollar by 2021 up from almost 33 percent from 2016 levels according to a research released by the quintiles ims institute the growth is predicted on the basis of various factors like market drivers current and upcoming trends current growth pattern and market challenges so while the major developed markets will remain the dominant contributor the emerging markets overall contribution to global sales growth will continue to rise to almost 35% according to an in-depth analysis by a leading consultancy firm by 2023 north america is expected to retain its leading position in the global pharmaceutical market with a market share of 45 percentage asia pacific pharmaceutical market is expected to retain its second position with a market share of 24 percentage europe is expected to be worth 20 percentage and then latin america and middle east and africa are expected to retain 11 percent market share of global pharmaceutical market so then let's have a look at the indian pharmaceutical industry india is prominent and rapidly growing its presence in global pharmaceutical industry the indian pharmaceutical industry is the world's third largest by volume with an annual revenue of about 41 billion dollars domestic formulation markets and also exports including so it is the largest provider of generic medicines globally occupying a 20% share in global supply by volume and also supplies almost 62% of global demand for vaccines so the indian pharma industry has been growing at a compounded annual growth rate of more than 15% over the past 5 years so the indian bulk drug industry has progressed from being perceived as an industry manufacturing simple api molecules to becoming the preferred destination for high value and complex apis the industry currently ranks third globally and has its advantage in terms of availability of a large pool of chemists and technologists well class facilities and low cost operations these are all about the pharma industry and outlook so then let's have a look at the company so the company today we are going to analyze is divis laboratory limited so divis laboratories limited is a leading manufacturer of active pharmaceutical ingredients intermediaries as well as nutraceutical ingredients offering quality products with a high level of compliance to customers in over 95 countries so the company is recognized as a reliable supplier of generic apis a trustworthy custom manufacturer to big pharma and is among the top api manufacturers worldwide so divis operates from its headquarters and registered office at hyderabad the company has six multi purpose manufacturing facilities from two sites with all support infrastructures like utilities environment management and safety systems the company has constantly been working towards improving quality systems compliance to environment and safety while simultaneously creating additional capacity with supporting infrastructure it is well equipped to serve several projects of customers of custom synthesized opportunities as well as increasing their generic businesses with 122 products across diverse therapeutic areas they are one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in india divis laboratory limited is a global drug contract manufacturing company serving 20 of the top 25 global companies with over 100 projects in the pipeline so if you have a look at their total revenue so they are doing almost 5500 crores increasing 9% and then if you look at their ebitda they have almost 2000 crores and if you look at the profit before tax is almost 1800 crores and profit after tax is 1372 crores in the year of 2020 and then if you look at the market capitalization it was almost 52000 crores but currently it's almost quoting at around 90000 crores the valuation went up and uh, the price went up huge So if you look at the net worth it was almost 7300 crores and if you look at the earning per share it was 51.71 at the end of financial year 2020 let's have a look at their uh, infrastructure how they established their infrastructure so in 1990 divis research center is first established and begin their journey of developing commercial processes and supply to pharma companies they 
put their first manufacturing facility commences operation at Chautopal near Hyderabad in 1995 and their second manufacturing facility commences in 2002 and then Davis goes public by filing an IPO in 2003 and they established a neurosetical facility at their Chipata unit at 2007 and they established a new research center in Hyderabad in 2010 and then their corporate office in Hyderabad in 2015 and they announced a significant expansion of their manufacturing facilities with a capex of almost 1800 crores in 2019 and if you will look at their research and development uh, so they first filed their USD uh, MFI in uh, 1997 and they first uh, filed their certificate of suitability in Europe in 1999 and the US FDA for the first time inspect their manufacturing facility in 2000 and also they did a lot of uh, they got a lot of awards and the EU GMP and PDMA Japan inspect their manufacturing facility for the first time in 2011 and now currently in 2019 they are the among the largest API manufacturers in the world so let's look at their business segment so what are their uh, businesses what are they doing so if you look at the generic API Divis Laboratories has had a successful track record in terms of large volume API supply. So given Divis economics of sale, strong chemistry skill sets, continuous process improvement to reduce cost and consistent compliance as well as the high gestation period for new entrant, the business prospects are attractive for the company. So the growth is expected to come from 10 new molecules it is currently working on. So the development and validation of these products have been completed with TV currently at the capex planning stage so if you look at the generic segment the two generics naproxen which is for pain management and dextromethorphan it is for cough suppressant account for a significant portion of their overall revenues dvs currently enjoys 70 percent global market share in these two products so these products are already mature with limited competitors having other priorities so Divis Labs is also increasing its presence in another niche area of cartenoids after acquiring the request capabilities. It has developed various types of cartenoids including beta-carotene, the largest in the group. So Divis has completed the validation of contrast media API products in both the generics and custom synthesis segments. So the contrast media APIs used in imaging are another big opportunity with a total addressable market of almost 4 to 6 billion dollars. So this is going to grow at 3 to 4 percent on an annual basis. So the complexity associated with iodine chemistry limits the competition in this space at the manufacturing level. So iodine based contrast agents are primarily used in x-ray imaging with its ability in complex chemistry DV has achieved low input cost for its APIs. So DV is well positioned to add new products and scale up existing products. So DV is making significant investment not only on capex but also on chemistry led process improvements. These technology driven improvements enable Divis Lab to lower cost in existing products to achieve better margins and lower waste. So being a large volume player, the process improvement is driving their substantial margin expansion for Divis. So this is all about their generic API business. So then let's get into their custom synthesis segment. So the custom synthesis business is a high margin one, but at times it is lumpy because it depends on offtake from customers. So they have global top 20 big pharma companies. This business had a difficult time in financial 2010-2011 as most customers resorted to destocking due to the global slowdown. However, this business has shown a good recovery due to improved business environment, strong R&D capabilities, India-based cost arbitrage and IP adherence are some key strengths of DVs so which will drive incremental assignments from multinational companies. So DVs has built their CRAMS which is contract research and manufacturing service business based on their long-standing relationship with big pharma companies. So they have a relationship with six of the top 10 pharma innovators. So the global CRAMS business is expected to grow at a CAGR of 9% over 2019 to 2023 on new investments in R&D. So as patent tracks lose their exclusivity, they can do a manufacturing of those products. This resulted into an increased demand for prescription drugs. So with its low cost, strong chemistry skill set, they can continue to gain market share and gain strong position in the cram segment as well. Big pharma companies have reduced their own API manufacturing capabilities and are increasingly looking to outsource their API requirements. So DV strong technical capabilities, large team of 350 R&D scientists, scale of commercial manufacturing and level of regulatory compliance 
is bode well for their business growth. Their ability to manufacture products ranging from a few kilograms to thousands of tons, it makes preferred partner for all of the top global pharma companies. So then let's have a look at the next business which is nutraceutical. This is a smaller segment compared to other two. So the nutraceutical business is growing about 10% plus. So the growth rate right now maybe 10 to 15% in the future but about 600 crores is expected this year. And going forward they are looking at the growth rate of 15 to 18% in the segment. Let's have a look at their product mix of their revenues. So almost 60% of their revenue is coming from generics and 40% of their revenue is coming from custom synthesis. So most of their generic products like naproxen, gabapentin, sartans, or levetiracetam, levodopa, carbidopa and pravagablin all these are lifestyle drugs and as they live as people live longer so they have to use them till the end so they, they have demand for these products so they are one of the largest manufacturer of peptide reagents and is a leader in products such as naproxen sodium which is anti-inflammatory drug and dextromethorphan cop suppressant so more than 90 percent of the cartosinide business comes from the europe and us so the market size is almost 1 billion dollar the current annual sales rate is 6 billion indian rupees and dv has just expanded capacity by 100 percent based on the demand so these are all about their business um, segments and then let's have a look at their revenue by geography where their revenues are coming from from which area so it is coming from so they are doing business uh, almost all over the world they are doing business in uh, united states they are doing business in europe they are doing business in india and everywhere so most of the revenue comes from europe almost 48 percentage of their revenues are coming from europe so almost 23.4 percentage of their revenues are coming from north america and 11.4% is coming from Asia and 13.1% from India and 4.1% from rest of the world. So if you have to dig deeper, so if you look into the geographical market presence, so in America they are doing 33% market share in financial 2017 and it reduced to almost 23% in financial 2020 and in Europe they almost do 40% in financial 2017 and it increased to 47% in financial 2020. So in India, it's almost uh, increased a bit, 12.85% in 2017 and it increased to 14.8% and in Asia, it's about the same, 11.66% to 11.2% and the rest of the world, they increased from 2.33% to 4.1%. So if you look at, if you compare the past year and the current year, so Asia, it reduced from 12.5% to 11.4%, Europe, it gained from 45.9% to almost 48%, America, it reduced from 26.8% to 23.4%, and the rest of the world, 2.9% to 4.1% and India 11.9% to 13.1% so they are doing pretty good uh, they are increasing their share in uh, Europe uh, so they do most of their business uh, export uh, because uh, most of their business comes from Europe and United States let's have a look at their manufacturing facilities so what are the manufacturing facilities they have so the company operates at two manufacturing locations the unit one which is the first facility located at village Lingogudam in Yadavari, Bhuvanagiri district, erstwhile Nalgonda district near Hyderabad, Telangana state, which started operations during the year 1995. This facility comprises 13 multipurpose production blocks with finished product areas for manufacturing of APIs and intermediaries. It spread across about 500 acres equipped with diverse equipment for handling various types of chemical reactions supported with all utilities and services and has added capacities and are upgraded renovated and modernized from time to time so they have set up a new dzsz unit on the available land at unit one and commenced commercial operations from a part of this facility during february 2020 so they have another unit unit two the other manufacturing facility is at village chipada Vinamunipatam mandal uh, visakhapatnam district andhra pradesh state so it is it has a 490 acre site so the unit houses an export oriented unit which has eight production blocks which has been operating since the year 2003 and a cz unit which went into commercial operations during the year 2006 and it has nine production blocks with all required utilities and infrastructure esn SEZ unit which has six production blocks and went into commercial operations during the year 2011 so all these units have been adding capacities and are upgraded and modernized from time to time. So and also they have uh, their other unit which is already operational during March 2020. 
So if you want to talk about their uh, research center, so the company has research center called as BRC at Sanat Nagar Hyderabad and process development and support centers at the manufacturing sites. These centers are involved in development of process for both new compounds and improvement of processes for compounds on the market. So their PDSC work on process development and scale up from gram scale further through various stages of development, process optimization. So they do a lot of these research in these research centers. So if you have a look at their subsidiaries, the company have two subsidiaries, DV's Laboratory USA in the United States of America and DV's Laboratories Europe AG in Switzerland for marketing its neuroceutical products and to provide a greater reach to customers within these regions. So they are almost present in uh, uh, in India. So they have two big manufacturing plants uh, in India. You can see in the see it in the map and they have uh, subsidiaries in USA and Europe. Mainly these are their uh, research centers and uh, manufacturing facilities and if you have a look at their certifications so DVS has triple certifications like ISO 9001 and ISO 14001 for their manufacturing facilities and the company has obtained food safety system certifications for vitamins and carotenoids so GMP plus B2 certification for production of feed ingredients and their all their manufacturing sites are periodically inspected by US FDA Europe and other agencies so DVS has a total of 38 drug master files with US FDA and 23 CEP certificates of suitability issued by EDQM authorities. DVS has filed for a total of 37 patents for generic products. So these are all about their manufacturing facilities and their current certifications. So if you are looking into their capex, what are their planned capex uh, or expansion, capital expansion or what are their improved capacity expansion for the future. So DVS has invested 2,500 crores in capex since financial year 2018. The current increase in sales has been driven by increased volumes from these facilities. So the recently commercialized DC SEC and DCV SEC units have started contributing to revenues. It has also included backbone integration products which would aid margin expansion. It has 500 crores in capital work under progress currently and would complete this capital phase by financial year 2021. So DV has also made an additional investment of 400 crores towards building capacity in the custom synthesis segment. One line has already been commercialized and two more are expected to be commercialized from first half of financial 2021. Moreover, they have announced new capex at CAC Canada with an investment of 600 crores to be spread over two to three years. Currently, local protests have halted this capex program. If you want to look into their other new uh, announcements, so a few new blocks are planned for new major custom synthesis opportunity which are under construction and erection of equipment on fast track. This investment of capex is to the tune of 400 crores. This new capex is in addition to the 1800 crores of capex planned earlier. So the majority of the utility, utility expansion is completed. So 500 crores of uh, capital work and in progress are expected to be completed before the financial year. So they are doing big capex investments they are uh, expanding their custom synthesis uh, segment also so currently they plan to expand their custom synthesis segment and some of the analyst questioned how are they investing pretty huge uh, currently so is it based on a project or why are they expanding the current capacity for the custom synthesis the management replied so historically they have a good experience with the uh, dvs so because they don't just invest because they have funds but they foresee an opportunity and they want to is the opportunity so this time in the last two quarters more in the last one quarter they have seen from the very big pharma of international europe and us they have received some very fast track projects with a lot of incentivization and these projects will have a very high return and they need to finish them on a war foot basis and these projects they have been doing they are the ones they are planning for 400 crores so they have to complete in the next six to nine months so look at that they are doing pretty huge things so they want to increase their um, custom synthesis segment and they are getting more and more projects so these are all about the capex plans so then let's look let's have a look at their um, exports versus imports so as i said they are a most uh, export based company so almost 87 percentage of their um, revenues is coming from exports they are doing exports 88 percent in financial 2018 and 19 and currently it's 87 percent and if you look at their imports which is their material consumption so 50 percentage of their uh, material consumption are importing so they are, if you look at the largest products over there, which is 18% uh, is the sales of their largest product. If you look at the top 5 products, which is 47%, if you look at their revenue of top 5 customers, they are getting revenues from 36%. Uh, 
from top five customers so their exports in dollar terms is 83 percent their uh, export in pounds is 11 percent in euro currency is five percent so let's have a look at their income distribution how their income distributes so most of their uh, most biggest uh, expenses is cost of raw material consumed and then uh, they have uh, other expenses and income tax expenses and the total comprehensive income for the year almost 24.9 percent and if you look at the employee cost benefit expenses so their uh, percentage of uh, sales revenue is almost 11.06 percent we can see the breakdown how much cost is going to the wages and salary and other benefits cost and what is their total personal expenses let's have a look into the financials here we are seeing the revenues or the sales quarter over quarter though they are doing pretty nicely so they are uh, growing so their growth rate is almost quarter over quarter is 31 percent 16 17 9 3 10 49 percent 21 percent 22 percent so they are doing phenomenally well and if you look at their sales uh, year over year they are also doing pretty good uh, it was 22 percent 7 percent and they degrew 4 percent in financial 2018 and then again 26 percent 9 percent and then it is expected to grow at 30 percent in financial 2021 25 percent in 2022 and 26 percent in 2023 so people are expecting high growth from this company in the coming years so let's have a look at their gross profit margin so how it is performing so they have a gross profit margin of almost 65 percent in quarter three financial 2019 and it reduced to almost 58 or 59 percent quarter two financial 2020 currently look at that it is increasing to 63 67 and currently the last quarter almost 69 percentage gross margin so they are improving their gross margin pretty well that's also a very very good thing and then if you have a look at their ebitda margin so the quarter over quarter ebitda margin they are doing 39.2 percent in quarter three financial 2019 and it, now it's almost 42.6 percent in last quarter and if you look at the ebitda margin year over year so it was 37.1 percent in financial 2016 and they are uh, slowly improving to 43.4 percent so in financial year 2020 it was 34.1 uh, percent it uh, dipped but it is expected to increase to 42 percent in 2021 42.8 percent 2022 and 43.4 percent in 2023 so these are the projections they are going to increase their ebitda margin that's the projections from many analysts if you look at their eps so currently the earnings per share it was almost 48.9 or almost 50 rupees look at the projections in three years they are going to double their net income so they are projected they the strong growth is expected from them but we have to see how they are executing the orders and how they are it is planning out in the next three years but the analysts are projecting very huge growth from this company for the next three years let's have a look at their dividend so they are doing almost uh, their 320 crores uh, in financial 2018 and they gave around 512 crores in financial 2019 and currently in 2022 it's almost 512 crores and uh, their dividend per share it was 10 rupees in 2016 until 2018 it was 10 rupees 2019 16 rupees and currently financial 2020 also 16 rupees so they are keeping up the, with their dividend per share and let's have a look at their income statement so in financial 2009 they did a sales of around 1180 crores and currently they are doing at around 5394 crores look at the growth so they are doing pretty good and also the net profit increased from 417 crores to almost 1377 crores in march 2020 they are almost doing around 1900 crores in financial 2021 so if you look at the sales growth they for the past 10 years they grew at around 19 percent the profit growth is 15 percent for the past 10 years and if you look at the return on equity they are doing 23 percent for the past 10 years that's also a pretty good number anything more than 15 percent return on equity i like them let's have a look into their balance sheet they are doing pretty good so 26.3 percent in financial 2015 and currently in 2020 it was 18.2 percent but it is expected to be above 25 percent for the next three years and if you look at the return on capital employed it was almost 26.1 percent financial 2015 and 2020 it was 18.5 percent but as i said it is also projected to increase and also return on investment capital it is also they are doing pretty good 31.2 32.1 percent in financial 2015 and 24.3 percent financial 2020 and for the next three years it's projected to be stay around 30 percent and if you look at the gross fixed assets it's also increasing eps is increasing net worth is increasing book value per share is also increasing if you look at the return on net worth in financial 2020 they are doing it around 19 percent so these are the charts over the year how uh, it panned out the return ratios it decreased from almost 30 percent to 20 percent and currently they and it is expected to go above 25 29 percent for the next three years let's have a look at their key financial indicators 
so their total debt to equity was almost 0 0.005 so it's it's almost no debt so they are a debt free company and if you look at their return on net worth it was almost 19 percent and if you look at the return on capital employed it's almost 30 percent in 2019 and 28 percent in 2020 and if you look at the current ratio it was 5.16 their debt to equity ratio is good uh, they have a operating profit margin of 36 percent net profit margin of 25 percent so they are doing pretty good and if you look at the some of the investments so they did the current investment in 2020 it was almost 971 crores uh, in SBA mutual fund short term they have a, a 971 crores of a short term deposit let's have a look at their balance sheet itself so they have 1548 crores in march 2009 and it increased to almost 8531 crores in march 2020 and they have no debt at all their borrowing is almost 38 crores and their reserves is 7257 crores so they are a debt free company they are doing pretty well they are they are doing huge investments out of their cash reserves so they are not um, raising debts to fund their growth but they are funding from their own money so that's a very good thing they are they are debt free and also still growing pretty huge that's a very very good thing let's have a look at the shareholding pattern so the promoter holds around almost 50 percent so the promoter is um, selling a bit slowly decreasing their shares but that's not much so they are holding around 50 percent and the fii's are increasing fii's are buying from september to december but dia or mutual funds are selling so we cannot some people are selling some people are buying so because the valuation went up pretty huge the stock ran up pretty huge so some people are taking profits maybe so the mutual funds are uh, maybe selling a bit and also uh, FIIs are buying that's a good sign but mutual funds are selling so they feel it's a bit overvalued or they are selling to take some profits out of their position so if you look at the mutual fund uh, shareholding changes so in the last several months it's almost net selling so a lot of mutual funds are selling or taking profits uh, from the share in the past several months and if you look at the biggest holders SBA equity hybrid fund they have almost 3.38 percentage of their AM. They hold a pretty huge uh, stake in this company. And then Axis Long Term Equity Fund, and then SBA Focused Equity, SBA Blue Chip Fund, SBA ETF Nifty 50, Axis Blue Chip Fund, Nippon India Pharma, and then Mirai Asset Large Cap Fund. So if you see Axis Long Term Fund increased 2 percent, and Axis Focus 25 increased 2.6 percent, SBA ETF Nifty they increased 0.79 percent axis blue chip fund they decreased mirai asset large cap fund they decreased four percent axis flexi cap they also decreased their share holding by four percentage let's go look at the salary of the management that's something i want to always uh, look into so the management they are taking almost around 103 crores they are taking almost 103 crores uh, as their remuneration it's almost about five percent so i would like uh, companies uh, taking uh, management salary less than five percent of the net profit so it's a bit on the higher side but it's still fine almost at the five percent level so that's still fine uh, so they are uh, on a good uh, range so that's that's still good but if, if, if it is a little bit lesser i would be happy but it's still okay five percent is still okay fine let's have a look at the valuation look at the chart if you invested in 2017 18 19 you are in a huge so the stock ran up pretty huge from 2017 to almost 4000 rupees it, it, it reached there and then currently it is seeing a little bit of a pullback so the stock is doing phenomenally well so then let's have a look at their p valuation so if you look at the p chart it increased from almost 10 to 20 to it reached to almost 40 and currently it's trading at around 48 p and if you look at the price to book it also increased from 4.5 to almost uh, 9 or 10 and it is also trading at a much higher valuation currently so they are valuing they are quoting at a much higher valuation now let's have some revenue projections so they are doing 3776 crores in financial year 2016 and uh, they did 5400 crores in financial 2020 i am projecting it to reach 6700 crores in 2021 8158 crores in 2022 9872 crores in 2023 with a revenue growth of 25% for 2021 21% for 2022 21% for 2023 and the net profit they increased from 1126 crores in 2016 and to almost 1377 crores in 2020 
and I expect them to grow to 1900 crores in 2021, 2318 crores in 2022, 2898 crores in 2023 with a growth of 38% for 2021, 22% for 2022, 22% for 2023. With the price target with the current valuation with the P of 48, the one year price target would be 3429 rupees which is 2% cumulative growth and in two years 4183 which is 24% cumulative growth and three years 5104 which is 51% cumulative growth with the current PE of 48 but I feel the stock is a bit overvalued so they are growing pretty good and they are a very good company they have a very very good management so they have a they are in a very good business so I think this can justify the valuation but still I am not comfortable buying uh, this company at 48 P because it is still growing the, the next three years it is projected their revenue is going to double their net profit is going to double but still I am not comfortable with the current valuation so I am estimating the price target with a PE of 40 so for one year is 2858 rupees for two year 3486 rupees for three year 4253 rupees with the price cumulative growth of minus 15 percent for one year and three percent for two year and 26 percent for three year this is my personal opinion so I'm not a financial advisor so I don't recommend any stock so this is my personal opinion so what I am currently doing with this stock so I am currently watching this stock so it, it is having a pretty good uh, pullback so I'm not currently buying this stock because uh, it is still a bit uh, overvalued uh, as far as I feel it can go up uh, 20 25 percent 30 percent for the next three years that's pretty nice but I always look into much more uh, good uh, risk to reward ratio um, yeah this can be pretty good if you are if you want to invest uh, for the long term for the next five to ten years this stock would be uh, very good uh, at the current valuation but if you want to do some kind of uh, short term buy so this this stock will not um, uh, provide that kind of risk to reward to play for the short term maybe for 10 years 12 years yes you can buy at this current levels but personally I will not be buying at the current levels I will wait and watch for this uh, stock and how it evolves if 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 it, if it has a price pull pullback uh, more than 20% or 25% then yeah of course I will I will add to this stock because it's a very good company but at the current valuation I am not buying I am not uh, investing in this stock that's all for today thank you for watching and if you want to get a free newsletter every month from this channel please subscribe to the newsletter so you have a link in the description if you want to or have a free newsletter you can subscribe to that newsletter in the description below and if you like this video like share and comment and if you want me to analyze any other stock please let me know in the comment section so that's it for today thank you for watching and have a nice day